our love for him is displayed in our obedience to him and to his word. You can say you love him, and he says, well, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I command you to do? Amen? All right, enough of that. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7. That's where we find ourselves tonight. We broached the chapter last week. Daniel is having a vision, and uh, the visions that he had seen has troubled him. Uh, He says that again. I think we ended off last week at verse 14. Am I correct on that? Yeah. Okay, Daniel is, uh, and I'm so thankful that the Lord calls us friends. In Sunday's message, we were talking about Lazarus. And Jesus referred to Lazarus as his friend. And what were the comments we made with regard to being a friend? You remember? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And therefore, he was called the friend of God. And then we went somewhere else in the New Testament in John's gospel to look at that idea of being God's friend. Where do we go? John 15, that's right, where he says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. All things that the Father has revealed unto me, I share with you now. And part of what we're reading here in Daniel chapter 7 is that being fulfilled, that Jesus Christ is sharing with us, his friends, everything that the Father has revealed to him, and particularly with regard to what would take place in this age. And more specifically, in the times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles is when the the land of Israel that God had given to his people would be dominated by Gentile powers. And when did that begin, the times of the Gentiles? The Babylonian captivity, the Babylonian conquest of that particular part of the world began the times that Jesus referred to as the times of the Gentiles, and it's referred to over and over again in Scripture. Now, this blip in time of the times of the Gentiles, it lasts from the Babylonian captivity, that's where it began, until until the millennial reign of Jesus Christ which is, I think, very near future. Now, that period of time, although we may think it is quite lengthy in God's economy, it's just a blip. It's just a moment in time. For uh, Psalm 90 tells us that a thousand years is as, and and a day as, is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I gave you a challenge on Sunday too, didn't I? Did you, have you discovered that mystery of the two days? Hmm. A day has a thousand years, a thousand years is a day that has something to do with it. So keep searching, keep looking. You'll you'll find it, you'll find it. But nonetheless, this is the time period we're talking about. What Daniel has received is a vision much like Nebuchadnezzar's vision where he saw the world governing empires that would arise during the times of the Gentiles. It would be the Babylonian Empire. It would be the Medo-Persian Empire that would come after that. It would be the Grecian Empire who would take over the Medo-Persian Empire. And then it would be Rome and the power of Rome. And was Rome ever conquered over by another empire replacing Rome? Who conquered over Rome? (laughs) Rome defeated itself, but eventually, what people group came in and really uh, decimated the Roman legions? It was the Gauls from the north. But did they form their own empire? No. What did they do? They divided and split up into little states, became nations, became Europe. Germany, Italy, France, etc. And, and what that really comprises is the old Roman Empire. So the Gauls, the people from the north, never created their own empire. And the Roman Empire, although it was weakened for a time, it is revived in that it is the ten toes of the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, partly iron, partly ceramic clay. And does iron adhere to ceramic clay? It wouldn't be a strong allegiance or a strong confederacy, but it would be a weak confederacy. And, and look at the England has been struggling to do what? Brexit, right? To break from the European Union. And so we see how fragile that union really is. But nonetheless, it is, it is the old revived Roman Empire that's going to be the empire or the governments for which the Antichrist reigns over. Where's the capital of the EU? 
Brussels, Belgium. Brussels, Belgium. And in all probability, that's where the Antichrist would have his seat, I think, if we're correct in the timing we believe we're in. And I believe that man of sin, the Antichrist, that uh, little horn that springs up that we talked about last week, he's alive right now. I don't know if he knows who he is. I don't think he does. But interesting for the time in which we're in right now. So that's where we ended up. And what, what Daniel saw was these four beasts in chapter 7. He saw a, a, the first beast was like a lion, a winged lion. What nation, what former empire was their symbol, a winged lion? Babylon. Babylon, of course. Yeah. And the second beast was like a bear. And the bear was up on its side. It had three ribs in its mouth. Now, now what nation did that represent? What empire? Middle Persian. And why three ribs in his mouth that he was devouring? Be, the three empires they conquered over, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians. Interesting. Then the third beast, the third beast was like a leopard. A leopard is known for its power, but particularly its speed. Hmm? And what nation or what empire did that represent? And how many wings did this leopard have? And why four? Because after Alexander, who conquered the known world at that time, who formed the Grecian Empire, well, after he died, the empire was broken up into, by his four generals. And so we've talked about that before. And then there was this fourth beast in verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So this is a monstrosity. This, this, this beast you can liken unto a monster. If you look at the dictionary definition of a monster, it fits it completely. It's, it's like no other animal. And that's what this was. I considered the horns now. It had 10 horns and, or 10 leaders, 10 rulers. I considered the horns and there was another horn, a little horn coming up among them before whom three of the first horns <coughs> were plucked out by the roots. And, and th in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. Now, who is this horn? What is it describing? And from the description, what do we know about him? Well, we know he's a contemporary of the first 10 kings, right? And as a matter of fact, he is ruthless, vicious. He actually overcomes three of the kings and... and takes control of their regions or their authority, their reign. It says it had eyes like a man. What did the eyes signify? Do you know? Here in the text, it would signify his intelligence. So he's ruthless. He's vicious. He's a contemporary of, of when this, this, this revived Roman Empire would exist, okay? But he's also very intelligent. And it says that he, he's a, a mouth speaking pompous words. He's very... Very arrogant, very boastful, very prideful, you know. When you say that he's intelligent, is that smarts or is that he's well educated? Smarts, smarts. He's wise. He's as wise as the serpent because he's got his wisdom. Understand that, that Satan has no equal among the human race. None of us would be his equal, Okay. Now, in our translated state, once we are glorified, then he is no longer superior to us. He is inferior. But right now, you need to recognize that, that the most ignorant demon in hell right now is more orthodox, more correct in his understanding of God and his ways than you are, than you will ever be. You understand that? It doesn't mean they're obedient to God. It doesn't mean that they serve God. But I'm just saying they have a greater understanding of who God is than you and I. But here, uh, we saw as well in verse 9 now, after we saw these world governing empires, and this fourth governing empire is not destroyed by some other empire. It's going to be destroyed by whom? By Jesus Christ himself. It says here in verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place and the ancient of days was seated. His garment was white as snow. His hair on his head was as pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued forth and came forth from before him. And a thousand thousands ministered him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. That just means an innumerable number of heavenly witnesses. 
and the court was seated and the books were opened. Who's the Ancient of Days? God Almighty. Now, I want you to make no mistake. Every devil gets their due. Everyone one day will give an account for their life and for their stewardship. Everyone. Even us as Christians, you know, we'll go before the Bema, seat of Christ. And we'll give an account for our stewardship on how well we were stewards over the life that he has given us, how well we are stewards over the precious people in our lives, our husbands, our wives, our sons, our daughters, our mothers, our fathers. We'll give stewardship for all that he has given us. You'll have to give an account. Now, for the believer, there will be no condemnation, but there'll be a lack of reward. We'd like to have a little bit of a reward, wouldn't we? Yeah. We want to be able to say to him, I just did those things which you commanded me to do. Nothing more. I mean, I didn't have any original thoughts about goodness. <laughs> but we at least, at least want to be able to say, Lord, we, we did what, all that you have commanded us to do. And, and so listen to me, beloved. When you know that your conscience is convicting you because you're violating some area of God's love letter to you, repent. Confess it. Allow him to strengthen you, to renew you, and, and to turn from that. So that one day you can hear, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now that joy speaks of many things, but that part of that joy is, you know, what, a, what a joyful thing it is when, a, when, a, when your children obey you, when your children are living the life that you would have for them. What a joy that is, isn't it? The joy of the Lord is that we're fully obeying him, walking in his ways, following him. <laughs> and then it goes on to say, and I watched, then, verse 11, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and for a time. All of those other empires and the leaders of those empires existed for a time, but were no more. But here he's saying that this man of sin, and this, this arrogant Pompous, you know that the Ancient of Days is going to judge him. And where is he cast into? Well, we read before last week, I think we looked at it, that he and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. This is not Satan himself yet. Satan won't be judged until the end of the thousand years. But at the beginning of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, both the false prophet and the Antichrist will both be destroyed and cast into the lake of fire or Gehenna, eternal torment and judgment. And I watched in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Who's that? That's Jesus. Yeah. Now, this is, this is all a refresher for you. We, we did all of this last week. One like the Son of Man, Jesus coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and, he, and they brought him near before him. Jesus, the Son of God, came to God Almighty, the Ancient of Days, and what's the purpose for this? What's going to happen? What is this business transaction that is taking place? The title deed to the earth, to the world. You see, in the very, very beginning, God gave the world and all things therein that he created for the pleasure of man. He gave it to Adam. Everything that is created in this material world is created for whose pleasure? Ours. 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 There is one thing that God created for his pleasure, and what's that? You. you. Isn't that interesting? That he created all of this for your pleasure, but the one thing he created for his own pleasure is you. Amazing. And so... Adam forfeited that which God had given us, the world, through sin. And Satan, the prince of the power of the air, the God of this age. That's how the Bible refers to him. He's in control now because it was forfeited. But Jesus Christ is the one who has redeemed all things back to the Father. Not just the world, right? You know the parable of the man who went through this field and found the treasure that lied therein. And that man went and sold all that he had to purchase the field for the treasure that lied therein. Now, some people I read interpret that parable and they, they don't get it. 
Who's the field? The world. Who's the treasure? You. Who's the rich man? Jesus. Gave all that he had to purchase. The, he takes the title deed to the earth because he was slain. Because he lived a perfectly sin-free life, which we could never do, and died on our behalf. And in Revelation chapter 5, we see the lamb as had been slain come and take the scroll out of the hand of him who sat upon the throne, the Ancient of Days. And he alone is able to loose the scroll, to loose the seals and to open the scroll. And that's the title deed to the earth. And that's what we're seeing here. That's this transaction that's taking place right now. And then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which should not be destroyed. Hallelujah! 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 Isn't that wonderful news? Yeah. Thou Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's, this is the fulfillment of that prayer that we've been praying for 2,000 years. And do you know it's beginning to take place now? Now, in our day? This is fascinating. Now, verse 15, I, Daniel. Now, remember that Daniel wrote this when? When did he have this vision? In the first year of Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. But, you know, he didn't say anything for a number of years. Didn't tell anything, anyone about that. He probably had this dream while he's well in his 80s. He's an oxygenarian at this point. And he said, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head, they troubled me. They grieved me. Look at chapter 2 for a minute. Nebuchadnezzar has the same reaction when he has this vision of the same message as being communicated supernaturally by God. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. He couldn't even sleep because he was so troubled by the dream. Daniel saying the same thing. I was so troubled and so agitated my spirit trying to understand what this vision, this dream was all about. Wouldn't we be agitated, troubled, sleepless if we didn't really understand what's taking place in our world today as we see the deterioration of the world? The world's become much smaller, hasn't it, with, with the modern technological advances that have been made, you know, the speed at which we travel now, the, the, the instant communication where the whole world can see the same event almost instantaneously, real time. But not only has it become a much smaller place, it is a far more corrupted world because evil is pervasive throughout all of the world now. And wouldn't it be troubling if we didn't know the end of the matter? Wouldn't it cause us to have many, many sleepless nights if we, if we didn't know that our God is in control? What does your wrist bracelet say, Rob? God's sovereignty is my In these crazy times. And then you've got to remember that. And God has revealed all of these things ahead of time to us so that you would not be anxious, you'd not be sleepless, you'd not be troubled or vexed in your soul. Just looking up. Why? Because your redemption draweth nigh. As you see, all these things begin to take place. Jesus warned of that, didn't he? Now, for the world, oh, my. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get so horrific that people will die in mass of heart attacks. How many people die a year in the United States of heart attacks? 800,000. That's a lot of people, isn't it? It's going to be nothing compared to that day. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of the head troubled me, and I came near to the one who stood by and asked him the truth of all of this, and he told me, and he made known to me the interpretation of these things. Who is it that he's talking to? Look at chapter 8, verse 16. Who is it that he's talking to? Gabriel, Gabriel. Yeah, that's also verified in chapter 9, verse 21. He's talking to Gabriel, the angel. How many archangels are there? Three. Who are they? Gabriel, Gabriel. Michael, Michael. Lucifer. Lucifer, Lucifer. You know, we, we know that, that, that the angels were all, were all created as ministering spirits, not just to minister to us, but to minister to each one of the Godhead. I'm just going to give you a little angelology right now, okay? Can I do that? 
Now, each one of these archangels was specifically created to minister to a person of the Godhead. Who's never heard this before? Okay, so then I'll share it with you. Yeah, so God Almighty, the Ancient of Days, the most powerful, right? El Shaddai, right? Who is the angel that would be associated with God Almighty, who's the one who always, you know, when something has to be dealt with, he's the one who deals with it. He's, he's the Lord's Benaniah. You know who Benaniah was? Solomon's hitman, you know? <laughs> Michael. Michael was created to minister on behalf of, the, of God the Father. It'll be Michael who binds Satan. Michael is always the, one, the mighty one who watches over the nation of Israel, who watches over God's people. And the third of the angelic hosts are under Michael's charge. Now, we have that angel who would minister unto the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit always is the one. We don't even know his name, do we? We just know he's, he's holy. But why doesn't he tell us his name? Because he's here to bear witness of who? Jesus. Jesus and Jesus alone. But he's, he's the one who always bears the message. He's the one who always speaks to your heart. And, and what angel would be associated with a messenger? Gabriel. Gabriel, of course. So Gabriel and the third of angels in his charge were created to minister on behalf of God the Holy Spirit. So now we come to the Son, to Jesus Christ. And who was created to minister on behalf of Jesus Christ? Lucifer. And then he rebelled. And that war in heaven that we read about tells us that he drew a third of the stars of heaven to earth with him. What did he do? He led one third of the angels in heaven in rebellion against God because they were under his charge. We don't call them angels today. What do we call them? Demons. And demons are real. No doubt about that. But this is Gabriel. Where else does Gabriel show up and give a message? To Mary in the birth of Jesus. To Joseph, don't be afraid. To Zacharias, Elizabeth. And, you know, he's the messenger angel. The Holy Spirit is the one who, who shares with us the message and makes it sure in our hearts, that message of love of God. So this was Gabriel. I came near to the one who stood by, and I asked him to tell the truth with regard to these things, and what's the interpretation of them? Verse 17, for those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. So this is the time of the Gentiles, beginning with the Babylonian Empire, ending with the revived Roman Empire. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Forever and ever and ever. Why is that? Because God promised it. Turn would be to 2 Samuel. Second, go to 2 Samuel. Chapter 7, God is making a covenant with whom? With whom? David. 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 What's David mean? Beloved. The beloved. The beloved of God. Now, now, David wanted to build a house for God. That was his desire, remember? And David had all of these wonderful plans, and, and Nathan said, go for it, David. And then the Lord spoke to Nathan later and said, David, David can't build me a house. Why couldn't David build him a house? Too much blood on his hands. But David was a man after God's own heart. He was after God's heart, and he had a heart for God. But, but like you and I, we're, we're flawed, aren't we? But we need to continue to pursue the heart of God. And have a heart for God, not for this world, not for our flesh, right? And so Nathan comes back to David and says, David, David, you, 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 you're well-intentioned, <laughs> but God won't allow you to do it. Your son's going to do it. But here's what we're going to allow you to do. You're going to be the logistics manager, the procurement manager. You're going to procure all the materials. You got that door on order? <laughs> we got our new front door on order. <laughs> Gonna be, pray that it gets here sooner than later. <laughs> but the, it's at least five weeks out, so we're, we're in the process. But nonetheless, David, you're going to be the material procurement manager. You're going to handle logistics. You're going to gather all the materials that your son is going to need to build me a house, a temple. But look what he says in verse 10. Verse 10, chapter 7, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. And we know where that place is, and God has determined that they would be there. God, by decree, gave the land of Israel to the Jews. 
and not to anyone else. Make no mistake about that. The contemporary church is, is completely misunderstanding. They have no real grasp of the Israelology of the Bible and the importance of Israel and Jerusalem. That's why we see the anti-Semitism growing more and more and more. And eventually we know it gets to that crescendo point in Zechariah where all the nations, all the nations of the world become against who? Jerusalem. 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 You're going to see that day. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people of Israel and plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously, since that time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. I have caused you to rest from all of your enemies. Also, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house, David. David, you wanted to build me a house? <laughs> Let me tell you, David, what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to build you a house. Now, this is the very house that Daniel sees in that vision that Gabriel is interpreting for him, that house that God's people will have forever and ever and ever. Yes, I will build you a house. Verse 12, then your day, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your own body and he, I will establish his kingdom. Who's that? Solomon, isn't that amazing? Solomon's mother was who? Now, we know that story, don't we? Isn't it? It's just how God uses such imperfect people. Isn't it amazing he uses us? Isn't it? Yeah. We, there should be no self-righteousness, no pharisaical attitude among any of God's people, really, if you really understand who you are and who God is. Hmm? But even here, he's going to use Solomon. And I will establish his kingdom. Verse 13, now in particular to our conversation, he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. As Billy Graham would say, forever and ever and ever. <laughs> forever. Now this, this is the kingdom that Daniel is referring to, that Gabriel is explaining to him. Forever. And I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the blows of the rods of men and the blows of the sons of men. Now, this is amazing. Do you know that God wrote this and promised this to David about his son Solomon before Solomon committed such grievous acts of sin? Before he desired and took another man's wife. Before he lied and conspired to murder the man before he tried to cover the whole thing up. Isn't this amazing? God is saying, I forgave him even before he committed. Wow. Well, when God chose you knowing everything you would ever do, knowing all of your sins past, present, future, if I were God, I would have never chosen me. If, if you were God, you would have never chosen you either, knowing what you know about yourself, Right? I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you and your house, your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Come on, help me here. Forever. <laughs> According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Isn't that wonderful? Back to Daniel chapter 7. Doesn't this excite you? Judgment doesn't surprise any of us, but his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness... It's amazing, isn't it? For it is the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Not the fear of God. It's the goodness. Verse 19. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured and broke in pieces and trampled the residue with its feet, and the ten horns which are upon its head, and the other horn which came up before the, which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. 
So he, he's asking for an interpretation of what we saw, what we read previously with regard to that fourth beast in verses 7 and 8. Verse 21, he says, I was watching. And the same horn, who's the horn? Was making war against who? Now, who are the saints at this time that he'll make war against predominantly? Believing Israel. Tribulation saints and those who are not raptured. Trouble anybody? If you're living a life in obedience to his word, as much as you're able, you have nothing to fear. If you're playing fast and loose, I can present an apologetic that you may not be raptured. There will be tribulation saints who are Jews and Gentiles. And predominantly the war that he is raging against the saints is believing Israel at this time. And look what it says, very interesting. I, wa I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Who was winning? Evil. Ooh. Sends chills on your back, doesn't it? Only for a time. The devil is whose devil? God's devil. And God's purposes will be fulfilled even in this. Paul tells us that as Christians, we will be as lambs being led to the slaughter daily as the time approaches. Like our Lord, we'll give up our life in belief in him. Now, this is during the tribulation period, which I don't expect any of you to be here. Praise the Lord. But I ask the question now, if, if, if it was necessary, will you die for him? Well, there's only one way you'll know the answer to that question is if that day comes. <laughs> but one way, one way in which you can be pretty much assured that you would die for him is if Oh, listen to you. It's absolutely true. See, if you're living for the Lord now in his glory, there's every reason for you to believe that he'll give you the power to die for him if necessary. Judas never lived for the Lord. And therefore, he, he would not be willing to die for him. As I pointed out on Sunday, there's only one apostle that was really willing to die for him when he went to the cross. Who was that? John. John. And there's reasons for that, which you could find very, very interesting. Uh, if you're living for the Lord, you have nothing to fear. I have a particular persuasion about the rapture that most people don't agree with, but I can present a very strong apologetic, and you can't want to refute it. Although it doesn't, it's just very uncomfortable. It's one of those uncomfortable truths But if, if I'm wrong and you're living for the Lord with all that is within you, do you have anything to lose? Everything to gain, right? In this life and in the life to come. Everything to gain. If I'm right, and I'm not speaking to you, I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but it doesn't any of you. But if, if you're playing fast and loose with the Lord and I'm right, oh boy, hang on. It's going to get far worse. You see, God gives you the measure of faith to believe, doesn't he? Puts it within you. And, and no one leaves here without knowing the faith that God has given him, that it's assured. John proved it at the cross. Judas never had it. The other ten proved it in their martyrdom. Oh, enough of that. Another time. Verse 22, until the ancient, they prevailed. He prevailed against the saints during the tribulation until the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus, he said, 
the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole world. It has complete global control, the Antichrist and his, his, his government, his empire, his system. And he shall devour the whole world, trample it and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, the Roman Empire revived, that, that fourth beast, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be different from the first ones and subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and laws. He's completely opposed to God's authority, God's rule, God's word, God's reign. And an attempt to change times and laws. What that really means, he's going to establish his own system of government, of economy, and of religion. There's going to be, just as the world predicted, just as the Bible predicts, a one world government, a one world economic system, a one world political system. I mean, a religious system. Don't be surprised at what's taking place, why there is this global control of the citizenry, how they're, they're, they're trying to exercise that control. A precursor is all of this craziness that's going on with the, the uh, COVID-19. And there's more yet to come. And how they want to control you and how they want to control the world is through fear, fear. It's amazing the freedoms people will be willing to give up for safety, for security. I mean, any of you read Francis Schaeffer? Ever read Francis Schaeffer? Years ahead of his time. He said, he said, before the time of the end, before the Lord would come, uh, the, the time in which we leave would be, would be marked by men, a, a, a false church, who are only concerned about two things, their prosperity and their personal peace, their safety and their prosperity. It's the economy, isn't it? Isn't that what that one? I'm thankful for our previous president, but he wasn't trying to promote and bring about a spiritual revival, was he? Strong borders, safety. What did he do to the Dow? How did you, how's your, he kept saying over and over again, how's your 401k doing? Prosperity. The one world system is developing now as we speak that one world governmental system it'll be a one world medical system as well the one world religious system will be led by who the false prophet I got some ideas about who that would be <laughs> he's, not even, he's not even orthodox catholic is he he's the most heretical pope that has ever come to power amazing amazing He came to change times and seasons, intending to change the complete systems of the world. What do we call that? A reset? I'm in verse 25. He shall speak pompous words against God and his authority, the Most High. He shall per persecute the saints of the Most High. Most of that is believing Israel at that time. He shall intend to change times and seasons and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hand, just as we read. And you'll see that in Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. Uh, turn there for a minute. Revelation 13, 7. So, so don't be surprised when this begins to take place. Don't, don't be discouraged. As we see evil gaining more and more authority and power and influence over the world. Don't, don't be shocked by it. Don't be frustrated. Don't be depressed or anxious. Know that our Father has told us that this was going to take place ahead of time. Praise the Lord. Now, we do everything we can to change that, to fight against that. But we will not win in the short term. We do win in the long term. But chapter 13, verse 7, it was granted to him, this is the Antichrist now, because that's who he's describing. Then chapter 13 talks about the beast who rises up out of the sea, and that is the Antichrist. And from beginning on verse 11 of chapter 13, it's the beast that rises up from the earth, and that's the false prophet. 
the beast that rises up by the sea of the Antichrist will have a false resurrection. In verse 3, it talks about a mortal wound, but miraculously he'll be healed. And they'll worship, verse 4, and so they worship the dragon who gave his authority to the beast. That's Satan himself. And they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? He's, 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 he's successful. Evil is winning. And he shall be given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months, three and a half years. That's the last three and a half years of the time of Jacob's trouble or that 70th heptad of Daniel. We'll get into that when we get into chapter 9. I'll give you more detail about that. And then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted him, verse 7 now, particular to what we're studying, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, over every tongue, over every nation. What does that mean? Worldwide control. Now, if I wasn't a believer, that'd be pretty frightening, wouldn't it? But I know he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole... Isn't that wonderful? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. All right, back to Daniel 7. We'll wrap this up. So he was given power over the saints... For a short time, they were put into his hand, verse 25. And then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. What is that? Three and a half years. That's the time frame we're talking about. You see, when people talk about the tribulation period, most people think it's the whole seven years. It's not. The first three and a half years of that period of time called, called Daniel's 70th seven or the last heptad is, is peace and prosperity for most not for the Jew and not for the true Christian, the true body of Christ. It's not peace and prosperity for them. But the last three and a half years, it's God's judgment upon this world. That's when all of God's wrath will break out. That's this 1,260 days or three and a half years or 42 months. Verse 26, but the court shall be seated, just as we read previously. Whose court? God. Here come to judge. Here come to judge. <laughs> Remember that? But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion, Antichrist, to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people and the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Hallelujah! Note Zechariah chapter 14. Oh, just turn there. Go ahead. We got a few more minutes, don't we? Zechariah 14. Go there for a minute. Malachi or Malachi. That's the last book of the Bible, the Italian writer. Go one more book to the left, and then Zechariah. Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14 describes, you have a heading in your Bible? The day of the Lord. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. I will gather together all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. So God is judging the nations of the world for its treatment of his people, for Israel and for the church. But look in particular now. Uh, verse 5, the end of the verse. Thus the Lord my God will come with all of the saints with you. It shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light. The lights will diminish. It shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time shall be, it shall happen that it will be light. Who's the light of the world at this point? No need for the sun and the moon because the Lord is its light. Verse 8 now, 8 and 9 in particular. In that day it shall be that living water shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea. That's the Dead Sea, and half of them towards the Western Sea or the Mediterranean Sea, the Great Sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Hallelujah. Lord, King Jesus, in that day 
it shall be. The Lord is one and his name is one. Now this is precisely what Daniel is seeing here at the end of chapter 7 when the Lord takes possession of that which is rightfully his. He's, he already is, he's already won possession of it by the sacrifice of his life, his blood. It's his. He just hasn't taken possession of it yet. And the Lord, the ancient of days, the righteous judge is going to arbitrate this situation and declare Jesus to be the true owner of the world. It is that verse in Revelation that says that the, that the kingdoms of this world and the nations of this world and the peoples of this world will become the kingdoms, the nations, and the peoples of our Christ and our God. Chapter 7, verse 28. This is the end of the account, Daniel said. But as for me, Daniel... My thoughts greatly troubled me. My countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Very, very contemplative about this because let me tell you something. Daniel wrote the book, but we're going to see as we get into chapter 12 that Daniel didn't understand what he wrote. It said he gave me a divine headache and holy indigestion. Because he didn't really fully understand it. But isn't it an amazing thing that, that you, listen, you and I understand the book of Daniel better than Daniel himself. And when was that going to be revealed? Look, let me just go to chapter 12 for a minute. Just want to end with this. Because we are privileged. He no longer calls us servants, but he calls us friends. Why? Because he's revealed all these things unto us. Verse 13, the very end of the book. But you, he's talking to Daniel now. I know you don't understand these things. I know it's given you a headache. I know you have a little indigestion. But you, go your way to the end, for you shall rest and will arise in your inheritance at the end of days. So he's telling Daniel not to worry about any of these things. That's not the particular verse I was looking for. Bear with me. Ah, verse 9. Verse 9, he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time. You reading that with me? Chapter 12, verse 9. Why is it? Why is it? Why is it for the first time in church history, we have a complete understanding of the book of Daniel, of the book of Ezekiel, of Zechariah? Why is it that we can have such clear interpretations where we don't get a divine headache? We don't get any indigestion? Why? Because we're in the end of days. We're in the end of days. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Shall we stand? David, you got a closing song?